This is Anthony Mason. You're watching Real Fan, Real Talk. Coming at you live from my house. Yes, I'm using my nice somber tone. I just want you guys to get the <laughs> feel of that statement I just made. This is a beta award-winning television show for the best program series here on BronxNet. The, yes, I, I said it right. The best program series right here on BronxNet Television, and that's the uh, Beta Award that we received. And, I mean, and I, 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 I like Vladimir. I think, I think he, he's one of the best. But at some point, the best got a clash. Go, Deontay know. Wilder versus Vladimir Klitschko. How far away are we? Are we from seeing that? And who wins? Man, you know, of course I'm gonna say I, I win. You know, of course I, I, I would never say no matter who people would say I would never see myself losing to nobody. I'm a fighter. I'm a warrior. You know what I mean? If anybody that come in and like, you know, you know, whether it was in the future, in the present or the past, you know, I'm a fighter. A warrior supposed to always feel like he's going to win when he finna get ready to go to battle. If you don't feel like you're going to win or you have any slout of, 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 of not being able, thinking that, you know, you're not going to win, then this is not the right game for you. You know what I mean? You done lost already. It's like the Lions, then you finna go in there and you finna get eaten, you know, like an appetizer. So, um, you know, I always feel like I'm going to win each and every fight, and I prepare myself, give, my best, give myself my best um, uh, uh, chance of winning. And, um, but um, we, I think that fight uh, definitely happened maybe sometime, 2006, sometime in, the, in the year 2016. You know, the thing about it. Uh, if the fight were to happen, Pacquiao versus Mayweather, who do you think would win? Uh, I never predict fights that I might have to keep scoring. So, you know, I, I'm not partial to one guy or another. It would be a great fight, though. Southport against the right-handed guy. Power puncher in Pacquiao against the speed guy in Mayweather. It's a great fight. Do you think the fight will ever happen? Oh, definitely. Definitely. All right, well, let's backtrack a little bit to uh, we were talking about tough man contest. Then you decided to go pro in the boxing world. Uh, what was that transition like exactly? It wasn't that bad. I mean, I fought a real fast pace. You know, unlike a boxing, boxing can be boring. I was never a boring fighter. That's why I skyrocketed and people, I, I, I got a lot of fans out there because I was not boring. I went out to fight. Just like, you know, a tough man you only got one minute rounds. So you got to fight quick. Well, I took that philosophy into the, the four, you know, the four round fights with three minute rounds and I just kept the pace up. So that's why they ended up calling me the king of the four rounders because I fought such a fast pace. They wanted to see that. Definitely a lot more exciting than when you see. How did you prepare yourself for life after basketball? First, I went through my little years and my retirement, and um, you know, enjoying you know not having to get up and and you know practice and this and that. And everybody asked me, "Did you miss it?" I said, "Man, I played 15 years. I uh, played every summer. So in 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 basketball years, I probably played about 20 some years anyway." Because um, I didn't work out with trainers or whatever. I played ball all summer. But um, as you, you know, as you retired and the income stopped coming in, you started thinking of different things to do. And uh, two years ago, I, start, I got into the life insurance business. And uh, actually, the insurance business itself, we, you know, we cover all facets of insurance. So you, you always got to do something after basketball. Because even if you're financially stable, it's just too much time on your hands just to be sitting around. So... You find something you like and you, you take advantage of it. Was it hard for you to walk away from the game? No. Nah, uh, you know, in the beginning of my career, I played for teams and coaches, you know, that, that was all about winning. They was going to do whatever it took to win. There was no hidden agendas, no no menial stuff getting in the way. And then, you know, down the stretch, I was on a team where, you know, other stuff was happening. And so by the time I, I was done, I was done. Each individual NFL player is a brand in themselves. And they should be building that brand. And, and certain things, you kind of have to make the decision on to not do in, in these kind of situations. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, I understand they're friends of his, so I understand why they would do it. But you have to also protect your brand and your investment, which is yourself. Because you don't want to lose endorsements behind your support of somebody else when, when you can support them in other ways. You're famous for the song ball and one of, one of your big hits, but I didn't know you could actually ball out there. You were doing your thing. Could you tell us about your performance? Uh, a little bit. I'm from Harlem. In Harlem, you, you grow up playing basketball. That's one of the uh, prime, th prime time things to do when you go outside. So, you know, that's where that stems from.
Now, you're hurting a little bit after the game, it looks like. And in the first half, you came over to the scorer's table. I heard you say, you know, the Danny Glover line, you're too old for this. But And your, your skills out there were a little bit old school, too. I saw the finger roll. I saw the, uh, you know, a little hook shot there. You lose, you lose a lot of old school moves all the time when you're out there on the court. Man, a bucket is a bucket where I'm from, you heard. I bet you I had the most points on the, on the, on the basketball court. You've been acting for a long time. Like some people can say they've been acting for a long time, but you've literally been acting since you were a baby. Can you tell us about your acting career and uh, how you got started? Did your parents like audition for you? Is there a family connection or how did that work out? Well, my dad got me an agent when I was younger and I started doing print work. That turned into commercials and commercials turned into movies. So just being consistent, you know, persevering and Good roles came out of it. All right, now, I don't want to take a short a short joke because I laugh, you know, because I'm a fan of yours, but you haven't grown much since your first role as a toddler. Yeah, nah, not much, maybe like two inches. But you are a great actor nonetheless. Uh, uh, Losing Isaiah was your first role as a toddler. Um, most famous for, you know, playing 50 Cent at a young age. Could you tell us about that role and uh, what it meant to you? Were you a fan of 50 Cent as well? Or? Honestly, I didn't even know who 50 was before I booked the role. Um, Eddie Murphy's son actually was the one that told me like who he was and let me hear his music and all of that. But that was dope, you know. That was that was one of the first roles where I was on a set and I, I had good mentors around me and I, I actually remembered the training and the, the feedback and the instruction that I got from those that's been legends in the business, you know. So it, it was my one of my favorite projects to work on. Now I know after that because I know your your, your manager after the fight was saying that you guys wanted to get get back uh, Roberto Duran, but that actually didn't happen after after that. Um, was there anyone else at the time that you really wanted to fight? It was it was a lot of guys at the time that I wanted to fight. I was I was trying to just clean up past. Um, past fights with guys just where they just took fights from me. Gotcha. Where I know I didn't lose, they just took it because it was, because this guy's name was, you know, this guy's name was getting ready to fight this guy. And they wouldn't give him the Lennon fight also because right. that was a fight that, that was um, supposed to happen. happen. Yeah. But the Lennon fight never happened. Lennon, I think Lennon said to you Lennon, that he'll never fight. I'm, I'm never going to fight you. I'm not going to fight you. I'm never going to fight you. Wow. I said, Dag, Ray, for five million, I'll let you beat me. <laughs> Mark the Statman Scavage, I'm over here by Boston, just outside of Boston, in Homebrook. Gonna have my toughest MMA fight so far. Heard a lot of things about this fighter. One of the toughest out there, so I'm really gonna have my work cut out for me, and uh, let's hope for the best. I might get demolished, you know. We're gonna see what happens, though, all right? Let's go. Root on for me. Finish him. Real fans, real talk.com. Well, Arthur Diamond's trip young and intern time for the white and black fans. Asia to Manhattan. I get all my facts from my bro, Mark the Stats Man. If you're not tuned in, I recommend the CAT scan. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And if your brain checks out, then you deserve a backhand. Sports, <laughs> gossip, all the hot topics. Real fans, real talk.com.